Thanks for having me, everyone. I've been up since 2 in the morning. I was on call, and I've had four cups of coffee. So I had baseline talk really fast. So um, just take it all in, OK? <laughs> all right, here are my disclosures. So um, we'll start out with an ARS question, because I think that uh, kind of uh, getting a sense of everyone's knowledge. So um, which of the following is not part of the initial workup for pediatric patients with anterior knee pain? Excellent. You all can now become pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Um, so excellent. Yeah, and we'll go over this a little bit more with anterior knee pain, which is kind of the, the bane of everyone's existence, whether in primary care or, or during ortho. So the goals of our talk, number one, I'll talk really briefly about epidemiology of uh, pediatric sports injuries, because I think it's, there's definitely a unique subculture that we have to deal with when we're dealing with, uh, with the young patients. Um, we'll give a, a, I'll talk a little bit about a global approach of how to work up these patients. I want to touch really quickly on pediatric fracture management because even though we talk about ligament injuries, we're talking about meniscus injuries, shoulder issues. The most common sports injury you're going to see in kids are fractures, so it's important to kind of have a couple of quick take-home points on how we manage them a little bit differently than the adult population. And then we'll go over some of the top things we see in this population, particularly non-operative things. Um, the various apophyseal injuries, the ostrich slaughters, et cetera, some pelvic avulsion injuries. We'll touch a little bit on Skiffy because I think it's important to know how that presents because you don't want to miss it. And then we'll touch on anterior knee pain, uh, which is the, uh, really the key thing uh, in terms of the pathology that we see. So why are kids different? Um, you know, I think that you know, back 15, 20 years ago, a lot of kids in sports had to deal just with your peer group or maybe a little bit about your parents. But now we have a culture where there's an extreme amount of pressure coming from coaches. Um, and then you throw in social media as well, too. So I think there's a lot of competing uh, interests when we're dealing with young athletes beyond just the pathology that they present with. And a lot of times how kids can voice how they're feeling um, can be very difficult. And also at the same time, kind of why they're voicing what they are can be determined by multiple different factors. And you, you can imagine the number of times I have actually coaches come into the visits with as well too and as soon as I tell a kid you know they've torn their ACL or they're going to have ACL surgery within 20 seconds they're on Twitter or they're on uh, you know Instagram telling their friends about it so I think we have to take all these various things into consideration a great website I'd recommend you go to particularly for uh, pediatric injuries is the stop sports injuries website if you just go onto Google and top, uh, type that in you go to the website it has great information um, for the various pediatric conditions you may see but one of the most startling statistics they have on there is that 50% of all pediatric athletes will suffer at least one significant injury a year and that's an injury that requires an ER visit a subspecialty visit or requires at least two weeks off from sporting activities so it's a pretty high number if you look at 10 to 15 years ago that number was more around five to ten percent so we're seeing a tremendous increase in the severity of the injuries that we're seeing in these young athletes. Now, because kids have a very difficult time voicing what's going on, and sometimes the parents will answer for them, there, there are a couple of key history questions that I like to ask. And really, it helps me differentiate out, is this something that's coming because they're just doing too much sports versus did something traumatic happen and we need to work it up a little bit further? Um, so for me, if the kids are describing their pain as kind of more insidious and dull, not as concerned versus sharp and traumatic pain. If it's diffuse pain, I get less concerned. Kind of the, the kid comes in says my entire knee hurts versus they can take their one finger and kind of point to the area where it's, uh, where it's giving them a lot of difficulty. Um, pain before and after sports, once again, is very common with your very classic young athlete overuse injury versus pain while they're playing. If a kid comes in and says, I'm fine when I'm warming up, and then suddenly when I'm playing in the game, it really, really starts bothering me. That's when I get worried. And the other thing is if they walk into the office, they're walking pretty normally. Um, I'm not super concerned, but if they're complaining of locking, they're having instability, they're limping, um, those are once again things that will make pique my interest and say, hey, maybe I need to work this up a little bit more further. Okay. Other key history questions, because we're dealing with this culture where they're playing a lot of sports, you want to ask how many hours per week they're doing sports. And one of the best statistics that I tell parents a lot is that you know, a lot of times we get asked, how many hours per week should I be playing my sport? And there was a great study done that if, said that if you do more hours per week than your age, there's about a 75% chance you're going to have significant injury. So for that 10-year-old who comes in, you shouldn't be doing more than 10 hours a week of organized sports activity. Um, so that's a good way to get a sense of how many hours they're doing. For runners, how many miles per week? For pitchers, how many pitches a week? Get a sense of how many teams they're playing on, um, if they've been kind of wearing different shoes, what kind of supplements they're taking, any prior family history, their grades, and most importantly, get a sense of their emotional health. Because a lot of times you can get a sense there could be a larger physical problem going on if emotionally they're feeling more down. So I think it's important to ask that as well, too. Now, another question I get is, you know, what are key physical exam maneuvers? And there really isn't one. I think the key thing to note in these kids is that where they're hurting is where their injury is going to be 99% of the time. Okay, So just get your hands on them, push on the joint, see where it's hurting, and that's where it's going to lead you to the injury based on what's there anatomically. Okay.
Now, as I mentioned, pediatric fractures are still the most common sports injury you're gonna see. So I think it's important if you see them, you get an x-ray, they come into your clinic and you're trying to manage them with some kind of key differentiations between adult patients and pediatric patients, particularly as it relates to sports fractures. Um, so once again, the vast majority of these injuries, about 75% of them will still be related to fractures, not ligaments and soft tissue. Um, children's can, children can mask fractures very easily. So if you get an initial x-ray on a kid, a lot of times it could be normal. And then a week later, they come back, you get an x-ray and you'll actually see it. So if you're concerned about it, have them come back in a week, get another x-ray and you may actually see a fracture there uh, when you didn't see it initially. And don't feel bad if you're immobilizing a kid. Kids don't get stiff, okay? So if you're concerned that, ah, I don't want to put this cast on, I don't want to put the splint on, they're going to get stiff, just err on the side of putting it on. Worst happens, they come back a week later, everything's fine, you take it off, they're not going to get stiff. Unlike an adult where you're worried about over-immobilizing them or having them affect kind of what they do day to day. Now, why are children's fractures different? So, you know, why does this gentleman get a fracture like this, okay? Not necessarily this kid, but a kid relatively close to that age would get a fracture like this. You can see there's definitely a different pattern, different structures. Um, and the big, big difference is that kids have the growth plate, or kind of in our terms, the physis, and that really makes a huge difference in terms of how we manage things. It involves a growth plate about a quarter of the time, okay? And the key thing is that whenever we get, you get a patient who has an injury with a growth plate, it doesn't always disrupt the growth of bone. It can disrupt it. Most of the time, it actually doesn't, um, which is really, really key. It just helps to describe where the injury is rather than the fact that these kids are gonna have a shorter limb or have a big difference in terms of how their, how their leg actually looks. And a disruption of growth can not simply just be length, it could also be how the bone's angulated. Um, and sometimes if you actually get an injury near the growth plate, you can actually get too much growth. So a lot of times we'll have kids come in, particularly our younger kids who are three or four, suffer a femur fracture, and something that leg actually grows longer because there's more inflammation, the growth plate actually stimulates more growth. So it's important to note that a lot of different things can happen with growth in this age group. The ones we get very, very concerned about, and this is particularly important with football players or um, players who are doing their collision sports, when you have a fracture around the distal femur, that about a 50% risk of growth disturbance. So a lot of times these kids will come in, they're playing football, they're 13, 14, 15 year olds, you think they've torn their ACL, you get an x-ray and they've actually broken their distal femur. That's a pretty big injury, just not for the fact that it, it's a big surgery to fix, but also because there's a high rate of growth issues down the road. So we get super concerned about that. The second most common is your distal tibia. Once again, we can think a lot of kids will come in with an ankle sprain. They've actually broken their distal tibia. So you get an x-ray on it. Once again, we're worried about growth disturbances with those kids. And then distal radius fractures, which are a little bit less common. We're really more concerned about the ankles and the knees. Okay. Um, the other great thing about kids is they have a much better blood supply. So there's less of a chance that they won't heal, but they'll heal quicker. So if a kid has an injury, you want to get it immobilized so it doesn't heal in the wrong position. So you don't have to immobilize them for as long a period of time, but sometimes if you don't get to them quick enough, then things can heal in the wrong position. So it's important to treat these kids appropriately. The other great thing is that if you look at that x-ray on the left, how many of you would have thought that that bone would straighten out like it is on the right? The show of hands. We did nothing for that, okay? This is the great thing about kids, the bones remodel. So we basically have a joke in pe pediatric orthopedics, as long as the bones are in the same room, they will heal, okay? <laughs> That's why I went into peds, okay? So um, you, can, you can tell that, you know, even in a period of three months, the body will continuously remodel it. So once again, the reason why I say this, if you get a kid comes in, a seen an orthopedic surgeon, and they, the parents come in and show you this x-ray where everything's angulated and off, and they're like, what are they doing? Who do they go see? Um, and you can imagine that a lot of this has to do with the fact that things were remodeled. So we can avoid surgery and they have great amount of healing potential. So just we have a little bit more leeway than the adult, than the adult population. Okay. The big treatment principles with kids, just like with adults, make sure you get an x-ray above and below. A lot of times kids will say it's their hip, but it's actually their knee. They'll say it's their ankle, it's their knee. Just make sure you're looking at things above and below. Um, kids can sometimes have these very subtle injuries, and then you'll see that they actually broke something a couple weeks later. And if they're tender around the growth plate, you can assume that there's some sort of injury right there. So just once again, immobilize them. Don't put kids in splints like this. They'll take it off, and two days later, even if something's broken, they'll be throwing it around coming into clinic. So um, without, if you're concerned at all, just put them in a cast, okay? Kids don't get stiff, okay? So I think that's the key thing, just always, um, always immobilize them if, if necessary, okay? So now we'll kind of go on to more, you know, specific sports-related stuff, some of the, the top cases. So, you know, the most common thing we see in kids, which sometimes are the most difficult things to manage, are the apophyseal injuries. These are the, the things where all the European names are, the Oshkosh Lauders, the Cindy Larsen, Johansons, et cetera. So those are, these are the injuries that come st strictly from overuse, but it's important to know how to recognize them and how to manage them, okay? And, you know, I've given this talk a couple times, and I gave it to some high school students, and they had no idea what growing pains was. Um, so uh, I like that show a lot, but 
um, not, not, not going on anymore. So really when growing pains are not growing pains, okay? Um, so there are a lot of different areas where muscles will attach to, to growth areas, and that's what apophyseal injuries are, okay? So an apophysis, and those are kind of outlined there on the board, are, grow, are the areas where muscles will attach to the growth plate, okay? When kids are going through periods of growth, what essentially is happening is that the bones are growing faster than the muscles can. Okay? So as a result, the muscles get tight. Also, at a microscopic level, there's inflammation occurring during this period of growth. So growing pains aren't just like this nebulous thing. There actually is things happening at the microscopic level. So not only getting inflammation where the muscles will attach to the bone, but they're also tight. So there's more things pulling on the bone as well, too. And as a result, you get apophysitis, where you get irritation of the apophysis due to these tight muscles or due to overuse. Okay? The most common one that we see is ostrich slaughters. That's when you get irritation down where the patellar tendon will attach on the tubular tubercle. You've got your kind of more um, proximal version of this, which is syndic larsen johansson syndrome, which is basically irritation of the patellar tendon at the inferior part of the patella. You have Seavers disease, probably the second most common one we see is the irritation where the Achilles attaches to the calcaneal growth plate. You've got ischial tuberosity apophysitis, which is basically irritation where the hamstring muscle attaches to the pelvis. And you've got the least common one is Iceland's disease, um, where you have your tendons in the foot attaching to the base of your fifth metatarsal. So there are a lot of different in nomenclatures for these, but basically it's the muscle pulling on the area where the apophysis is and causing irritation. Okay. The key things when these kids come into the clinic is they're usually between 7 to 12 years of age. A lot of times they'll get these 16, 17, 18-year-olds in, and they'll say, I have ostrich slaughters, I have Seavers. You have to be skeletally immature by definition to have these things, okay? Um, and that's why it's important to notice that, because if they're 17, 18, 19, they're done growing, then you start worrying about tendon injuries where these things occur. So if you think they have ostrich slaughters and they're 18, it's really not. It's the fact they may have something going on with the tendon above it because their growth plate's closed. Usually their patients with Seavers disease are usually going to be younger. Um, usually the other pathologies are going to be a little bit older, just kind of how the muscles develop. Um, these are almost exclusively going to be soccer and basketball players, people who are playing a lot of explosive jumping sports. Um, this is going to be your age group, okay? And it's always due to overuse. No one ever develops ostrich slaughters or Seavers just from like playing one game. It's a repetitive activity over a long period of time. And it occurs during the time they're going through the growth spurt, okay? And the other key thing on physical exam is that they're going to be painful over the bone and not over the tendon. Okay, and that's all of these apophyseal overuse injuries are going to be tender over the bone, not that soft tissue area. Okay, so Oscar Schlatter's hopefully none of your seven-year-olds have this much hair on their leg, um, then they need an endocrine workout. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's where they're going to be sore over the tibial tubercle. Okay. Um, for your sievers, it's going to be tender right over the heel, okay? Now, if you go a little bit more distally, you're going to have your kind of plantar fascia pain that you see in adults, and a little bit higher, you have your Achilles pain. Classically, sievers patients, you squeeze on their calcaneus, it's going to be really, really, really sore over there because that's where that calcaneal growth plate is. The key physical exam findings is that it's going to be during their growth spurt, and they're going to be super, super tight. So you can have them try to touch their toes. You can try to have them stretch their hamstrings out, and I'll show you some of those things. Um, and the tighter those muscles are, the more sports they're playing, the more likely they're going to have these issues, okay? The treatment for Oshkosh slaughters, um, you have your basic principles of rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, you really have to cut down their activity, and that's really the key thing. The toughest thing I have to do you know, when I see these kids and their parents in is that this is an overuse issue. You just have to stop doing your activity, and that's the hardest conversation to have. There's no magic injection. There's no magic pill. There's no magic brace. You just got to stop. Okay? Um, if you get kids to stop, they'll get better. The number one reason they come back is because they haven't stopped doing what they're doing. Okay? Um, stretching and sometimes physical therapy are beneficial. Um, if they have flat feet, you can get them um, inserts. Um, patellar tendon straps sometimes work, particularly as they're getting back to play. Um, and kind of very similar treatment principles for Seavers. The difference being is that um, instead of using patellar tendon straps, you can use these heel cups. Um, try to avoid um, wearing cleats a lot because those can be uh, problematic. Um, and once again, stretching and making sure you're resting from activity, okay? Sometimes you get parents in who still don't want to stop, okay? In Oscar Schlatter's, in a certain percentage of kids who have very, very severe pain and then are continuing to do sports, you can actually pull off the tibial tubercle, okay? It's rare, but it can happen. Um, so once again, parents will ask, well, what's the worst that can happen? Now, my kid can put up with the pain. This can happen, and then you're requiring surgery. So there is a certain extent when you overload the muscle and tendon so much that you can actually pull the bone off, um, and, and that can be very traumatic. So once again, um, if the parents aren't willing to stop, you don't want to have to break out the scare tactics all the time, but this is something that can happen as well too. Okay? In terms of return to play, it's all like a lot of other overuse things. You get kids pain-free get their motion back, get their strength back, and let them get back to sports. Most of the time, this takes about six to eight weeks if they're really following it. You're always going to get these kids in as well, too. Sometimes it's going to be this three-month three prolonged process because they'll feel better, they'll go back to sports, they'll stop, they'll rest. You just really need that six to eight weeks of rest in working on the underlying mechanical issues that are causing it. Okay.
And then we have the next kind of grouping is that when you get some of these pelvic avulsion injuries, and these are you know on a similar spectrum, but they're much more traumatic, and they can sometimes masquerade as, the, as these apophyseal injuries. Now, the important thing to note is that where you can get these avulsion injuries are where these muscles attach to the bone, okay? And these are primarily going to be those older kids whose bones are starting to fuse a little bit more, their muscles are getting a little bit more explosive and strong, and they're going to pull pieces of bone off. The reason why this can be sometimes, you know, kind of disturbing for parents is they'll get this x-ray report that says you fractured your pelvis, okay? And then they'll get sent home from the ER, they'll come to the clinic, they're like, I fractured my pelvis, that sounds like something very, very scary, why aren't you doing surgery on me, okay? It's important to note that the vast majority of these pelvic avulsion injuries, once again, will heal on their own, but it's important to recognize it as well, too. And this is going to be more your high school age group. Um, the areas where you see that is a lot of where these muscles attach. It's where your adductors attach, where your rectus muscle attach, where your hamstring muscles attach. These are the really powerful muscles that span a wide area where you can have these pieces of bone come off. Okay? So these typically are going to be your older patients. Sometimes you can even get in your 20s that will have that. Um, and the classic thing these patients will be doing is that they'll be running, they'll be jumping, they'll feel they heard a pop, and they fall to the ground, okay? It's almost exclusively your sprinters and jumpers, your football players, your really explosive athletes, those who go from rest to kind of complete explosive activity very quickly. It's a sudden violent muscle contraction, um, and you get the separation in the bone, and I'll show you these, uh, these x-rays on the next couple uh, slides over here. So if you look on the lower right over there, you can see where the hamstrings are attaching. You can see a piece of the... Uh, um, kind of the ischium over there, kind of pulled off uh, from a hamstring issue. You can see that right over there. Um, another example you can get as well, too, um, is that if you don't treat this appropriately and you don't rest them, you can see how you can get a lot of calcification over there on the right side. So you want to be able to diagnose these promptly so you avoid chronic pain. Um, you can also get these over in the pelvis where the rectus muscle attaches. And if you look at that hip over there, you can see there's a lot of excess bone around the uh, acetabulum. So once again, that's a issue that wasn't identified, and then they started developing a lot of bone and then had issues with their range of motion down the road, okay? The treatment is rest. You want to keep them on crutches until they're pain-free, and you slowly get them more flexible, get their strength back, and treat it like a regular soft tissue injury. So once again, these kids as well, too, will get back to their sports in about six to eight weeks, okay? I'm going to touch really briefly on Skiffy, and the reason why I do this is typically these aren't sports injuries, okay? But you need to recognize it when kids come in because they'll present while they're running, while they're doing activities. And if you miss it, this can be a huge, huge issue for these kids long term in terms of arthritis. So it's important to recognize when this may be an issue. Um, and once you kind of know the factors that will cause this to happen, um, you can identify it in the kids who come into clinic. Okay? So I like to use the example of the ice cream falling off the ice cream cone. That's exactly what the skiffy is. The ice cream is kind of the, um, is kind of the, the top part of the femur, and the cone is more of the femoral shaft. Okay? Um, so this is actually a common problem. We see about one or two of these a week over at our children's hospital. Um, and there's an increased risk in certain groups. It's almost exclusively male. They're going to be a little bit on the more obese side. They're going to be around their um, uh, kind of pubertal ages. Uh, and typically a lot of uh, Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, uh, patients will, have, uh, will, will present with this. Okay? What's basically happening is the epiphysis, which is the top part of the femur, is falling over. Okay? The reason why we get worried about that is if it stays like that, you can develop arthritis almost immediately um, with this, this type of problem. You can develop cartilage damage. It can be really traumatic to kids in terms of their ability to stay very active. The reason why it's important, a lot of these kids are obese. They're already on kind of that path of getting diabetes, of having things as adults. So being able to maintain their mobility and making sure that they're able to stay active is really, really important. Okay? So basically what's happening is that, that the top part of the femur is falling off. There's blood supply attached to that area, so that's why that blood supply can die, and you can get abnormalities in terms of how your femur will actually look. And you can see all these blood vessels that are attached um, to the femur over there. The reason why we care is because there's a high risk of avascular necrosis and arthritis with this. So it's important to identify it early and get them treated so these kids don't walk around for a year or two and then develop more issues. Okay? So if any pediatric patient comes in who's a little bit obese, comes in complaining of groin or thigh pain, and they don't necessarily have trauma, you should definitely get a pelvic x-ray. A lot of times these kids will even come in with kind of vague knee pain, and you'll be fooled in it, and they'll keep getting the x-rays, they'll go to PT for their knee, they keep having pain, they keep having pain, someone gets a pelvic x-ray on them, and they see they have a skiffy, okay? So it's really important that the pain seems kind of vague, it doesn't really make much sense. Get a pelvis x-ray, and you can see it, okay? They may or may not be walking in, and a lot of times kids who don't have acute skiffies will just simply just walk into clinic and say, I've had thigh pain for one to two, one to two years, and you're like, okay, well, go to PT, do some stretching, should be fine, and they keep coming back, and no one's ever looking at a pelvic x-ray, so it's important to do that. Okay? They may complain of knee pain as well, too. So it might not even be thigh, thigh pain. It might just be knee pain, and you're kind of caught in thinking that this is more of a patellofemoral type issue. So always get a pelvic x-ray on them, if you're, particularly if, they, if it fits the story. Okay? And if you're not sure, get an MRI. A lot of times you can catch skiffies really early with an MRI of the hip, and you'll see it over there. Um, the really key thing is if, whether they're able to walk or not. 
lot of times if kids aren't walking, they're going to present to the ER. If they're able to walk in, um, it's a little bit better prognostic factor. But if these kids come in, they have thigh pain, it's really severe, there's a very high risk they're going to develop arthritis in the future. Okay. Um, the best way to be able to tell us on an x-ray is you get a regular pelvis x-ray and you draw a line just kind of on that lateral aspect of the femoral neck. If you see some of the femur not lateral to it, then you worry about a skiffy. That means that it's kind of um, falling more medially. Okay? And you can see that in the x-ray over there. Um, over on the left side of the screen over there, that's a normal x-ray. On the right, you see that there's not any femur kind of to the left of that line more approximately. So that's going to be a sign of a skiffy. Okay? If you see them, send them to the emergency room, because even if they've had it for one or two years, it just takes one fall, takes one little trip to tur turn it into a much bigger issue. And really our goals of treatment are to make sure it doesn't get any worse, okay? In the past, we tried to make it better by basically putting the top of the femur back on top. It didn't work very well, and it was a very large operation. For most of the time, what we're doing now is just putting a screw in there to make sure it doesn't get any worse. Um, so you can see that it used to be really big operations, and now we're just putting one screw in uh, through a little tiny incision to help it get better. In terms of these kids, we keep them off of it for a little bit. We get them back to sports, and most kids can be back playing sports in three months. Um, but we keep following them to make sure they don't develop arthritis. So once again, key thing, kid comes in with thigh pain, they're a little bit obese, get an x-ray. Um, a lot of times it's going to be your football players, your rugby athletes who are the ones who are going to come in um, and make sure you, uh, you look for that. And finally, the most favorite thing for everyone is anterior knee pain. Okay? How many people have, anterior, have seen anterior knee pain in pediatric patients? Okay, um, very similar to what we see in adults, but it's probably the most common complaint that we see. Okay, um, so a lot of times people ask me, well, what is patellofemoral syndrome? And I think the key thing is it could be 40 different things. Okay, um, and there's just a list over there. But I think the, the key thing that kind of binds everything together, it's irritation behind the patella. Okay, it can come from a lot of different etiologies, but the end game is usually the same. And usually these are kids who come in, there's not any history of trauma, and they're having a lot of vague knee pain. Okay, um, very rarely will they have one acute injury. They're going to say it's really dull around the kneecap or feel they kind of feel it deep inside. Okay? Um, one of the things I've heard a lot of kids say, it feels like sandpaper underneath my kneecap, where things are kind of grinding back and forth. Okay? They play sports all the time. Very rarely we'll get kids coming who have anterior knee pain who aren't doing too much activity. So it's really an overuse issue, just like the other, other etiologies we talked about. Um, the other thing they'll talk about is when they go up and down stairs, it hurts a lot, or when they sit down in class for a long period of time, it hurts them. So we call it the theater sign, where they feel like they need to keep their leg extended um, when they're sitting down for a long period of time that's causing them to have that discomfort. Um, their exams usually going to be pretty normal. Sometimes they'll be a little sore around the kneecap, but they'll say, you know, it's just really this vague thing that happens when I'm playing sports, kind of aches me, but when you push on it, it doesn't hurt me that much. And most of these kids will lack flexibility and core strength. Okay? So there are a lot of risk factors for it. The key thing is overuse. Okay? Once again, just like the ostrich lauders, the sievers, they need to stop doing what they're doing. Um, the best way to get a lot of these kids to understand that they need to work on strengthening, um, and there's a mechanical issue for that, is that have them do a single leg squat in clinic. Um, and you're trying to basically look you know, for proper form, which is on the left, where they'll do a single leg squat and everything's nice and lined up, versus all the way on the right, where their leg's kind of dropping in. There are studies now that suggest that for, particularly with female athletes who develop anterior knee pain at 10, 11, or 12, they're at higher risk for developing an ACL tear when they're 14, 15, or 16, okay? The reason being that the same biomechanical issues in terms of weak core strength, lack of flexibility, that will cause, an, uh, that will cause anterior knee pain at that age are the same things that will cause an ACL tear at 14, 15, or 16. So a lot of times you get uh, parents or athletes in who don't want to do their physical therapy. This is a great way to kind of tell them what the risks of, of, of not treating it down the road are, okay? The other thing you can do is and assess their popliteal angles to see how tight their hamstrings are. Um, kids should be able to get their legs straight when their hips bent to 90 degrees. A lot of kids won't. Uh, so tight hamstrings will cause this. Um, and test their core stability. You'd be surprised how many year-round soccer players who claim that they're going to get a scholarship can't do a plank for more than five seconds. Okay? So definitely, you know, that's a great way to tell them that, yeah, you're a great soccer athlete, but your core strength, your flexibility is really bad. Um, so you need to work on that so your knees don't hurt. Okay? I will only get an extra if there's anything concerning. Um, for that, and almost never, ever, ever do I need, ever need to get an MRI. The only time I ever will get an MRI, like that ARS question we talked about, is if they haven't gotten better after physical therapy. So if kids have been resting, they've done 6 to 12 weeks of physical therapy, their strength's gotten better, their flexibility's better, and they're still having pain, then we'll get an MRI. If you get an MRI right when they present, the MRI report's always going to show something wrong, and the parents are going to, you know, kind of perseverate over that. There's going to be inflammation here, inflammation in the meniscus there, maybe a little tear here. Just don't get the MRI, because then they're going to be worried about that. Okay. The treatment is rest and then physical therapy, particularly working on core, uh, stretching, and then uh, any kind of orthoses if they have uh, any issue in terms of flat feet. Okay. Um, the other thing, a lot of these kids will come in, uh, and particularly in parents who may have had knee pain 20, 30 years ago, is they'll wonder why aren't they working on strengthening my quads. Okay. And that is a picture of my quad there, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs>
um, they're working on uh, core strengthening and, and doing a lot of things. So a lot of kids will be like, I didn't even work on my knee. Well, it's because they're working on the things that will make you uh, be more stable in terms of your activities, okay? And then the consequences of playing. Um, you know, pe kids will ask, well, what's, what, can I play? I have anterior knee pain. There's nothing wrong with me. Can I play? I really like to break it down in these three groups for kids. There's no structural damage, but the pain may last longer, okay? There's a minor risk of structural damage. If you're having a lot of pain and you start compensating, then you can hurt your ankle or knee. Or if you're in so much pain, you're limping, then you're definitely going to cause damage to other structures. So I think it's, it's a good way to think about it um, when you have your, uh, your kids in clinic. Is surgery ever indicated for this? Rarely, less than 1% of the time. A certain percentage of the population will have something called a plica, which is this band of tissue that runs over the inside part of the kneecap. Um, it's very specific. Rather than having vague knee pain, they'll have pain right in that area um, where you can see kind of on that lower left-hand side. But once again, it's rare. Almost everyone has this when we go in there arthroscopically, but it's, you can convince yourself that you need to do surgery on it. Surgery really is the last resort, and kids really have to convince me um, that they've done everything, continue to have pain, and have pain in this region to require um, any kind of surgical intervention. Okay, so my top 10 list. Number one, pediatric sports injuries are at a really epidemic level. They've increased 10, 11 fold since uh, over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, kids have a hard time verbalizing what the, what's going on, and they have multiple pressures. So just like we we're talking about with concussions, how kids will say they're doing fine, they're not having symptoms, they want to get back to play. Um, you have to kind of take their whole sports uh, sports participation, who's in the room with them, into consideration. Um, where their sores, where the injury is going to be, 99% of the time. Um, but also remember that, you know, get your x-rays. Pediatric fractures are the most common sports injuries we'll still see. Um, kids don't get stiff, but they heal faster. So watch out for, um, be, be fine and mobilize them and watch out for growth issues. It's okay to over immobilize them. Um, bony tenderness in an athlete is going to be apophysitis until proven otherwise. Um, if someone has pelvic pain and they have a pop when they're running, worry about an avulsion injury. Um, kid comes in with thigh pain, got to rule out a skiffy. And last, look at mechanics and core strength for kids who have anterior knee pain uh, to make sure they don't have that again. Thank you.